I have got a tale to tell. Uh, apologies that it might feel a bit patronizing, because it is, in a sense, a fairy tale. Something of a fairy tale, but it's an interesting one, because it is a journey from a dark place into a good light place. And I couldn't believe it when I saw the symbols that was going to be the theme for today, the butterflies, because you will realize at the end of this tale, it's a bit of a butterfly story. An alternative could have been the ugly duckling. Could have been. It isn't. It's this one, A Journey into the Light. Now, I'm going to tell you the story about a baby that was born once upon a time, a long time ago, in a land far away. I think perhaps before I begin the tale, I should just go, hi, because that's usually how people introduce themselves and greet one another. So I'm going to give you a cheery wave. Give me one back. OK, thank you. While your hands are in the air, and put them down, <laughs> count your fingers. All there? Looking good? Other hand? All there? You're normal? Are your mates next door to you normal? Have they got their five fingers? <laughs> yeah, look around. I'm, I'm hoping that the answer is, yep, we've all got our five, five fingers on one hand, five fingers or four fingers and a thumb on the other. All good. It's kind of appeasing to feel normal. I'm okay. I've got my fingers. I've got my toes too. Good. It's not always the case for us humans. Let's go back to that country far away. Once upon a time, a baby was born. Early in the morning, 6.30 on the dot, bang, poor old mum woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, apparently the mother of this poor baby with a sore throat thinking, oh God, I think things are moving. Woke up her husband, rushed off to hospital, baby born, all wonderful. She was in bed having breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning as if nothing had happened. The babies in those days were taken away to the nursery so the mothers could have a nice peaceful time. I think it's a wonderful system and they should bring it back. <laughs> However, this is not what happened. Uh, it's not what happens these days, but it certainly did then. Baby was taken away to the nursery and the mother was left peacefully relaxing for the next day or two or three or four. I think it went on for ten days in those days, but there we are, uh, before they went home. The next morning after the baby was born, the mother was uh, uh, handed a copy of the daily newspaper. And as you do, you open it up with gusto and start reading it. And what she saw shocked her so badly. She called for her baby immediately. Now, what did she see? Well, on that day, a breaking news story across the world announced the horror that was this terrible drug, having been believed to be one of the most wonderful things that science had created up until this point. It had been discovered that this drug, which was designed to allay morning sickness, now, luckily, a lot of you in the room don't know anything about that dreadful thing, but it's quite a common ailment which women who are pregnant experience, especially in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. It is, as it suggests, morning sickness, sometimes afternoon and evening sickness as well. And anyone who says, well, I've got something really good for you, perfectly safe for baby, you can take it. It must have been tempting. And women all around the world were taken up by this offer. The name of the drug uh, the generic name is thalidomide, but it went under a number of different guises. And in the UK and in UK countries, Commonwealth countries, it was sold as Distabel. Now, that article that the mother read labeled Distabel as a maiming drug. To be maimed is to be totally incapacitated, as you know. And the horror was that fetuses all over the world had been affected by this drug. And they were born, if they were lucky enough to be born, 
without having been aborted because they just simply wouldn't have survived having been born. They were born without arms and legs, fingers and toes. Sometimes horrible fusion had happened to those limbs. How awful that must have been for mothers. This was the news that our mother in that maternity ward heard. She read about it. She called for her baby instantly. She called for the baby, whipped off all the, I suppose, swaddling clothes back in those days, and counted the baby's fingers and toes, checked over her limbs. Fortunately, the baby was fine, absolutely fine. But not so other children around the world. Prepare yourself. I've chosen lesser shocking images babies who weren't so lucky as our baby in that maternity hospital who had terrible afflictions the babies that survived were lumbered with those afflictions for the rest of their lives some of those babies are still alive today some have done amazing things with their lives all credit to them starting life like this is not easy carrying on life like this is not easy. Just imagine of the 46 countries that are affected, there were 10,000 babies suffering this condition, all down to this drug. In the UK, as you can see, there were 2,000 babies that were born with defects, but only 466 actually survived. Our baby, in our faraway land, was not one of those severely affected. We'll hear more about her just now. But spare a thought for those babies born back at the beginning of that decade in the 60s. No arms and legs. There were no electronic bionic arms, no fancy materials to enable them to do what they had to do. These poor little kids had to make do with rather Heath Robinson style contraptions to make their way through life. Spare a thought for them. But back to our young baby. She grew up healthy. All was well. I wish I could say, and everybody lived happily after, happily ever after, because that would be good in a fairy tale, don't you agree? No, not this fairy tale. All was not well. Apparently it was, and it seemed fine. But something had happened in those essential early months of pregnancy which that drug implicated. One of the things was the baby's face was affected. The growth of the bones in her face were affected. And that meant instead of normal facial development, there was kind of a mismatch in the development that was ongoing. The bones in the upper part of the baby's face were restricted in terms of their growth. And almost by nature's way to try and compensate, well, not enough's happening up here, let's try and make something happen down here. The baby's jaw developed too much, too much growth happened there. And it was okay for about five or six or seven years, but then angles started coming into it. The baby's teeth, the child's teeth now, didn't meet properly, and braces were necessary, and headgear contraptions, and all sorts of apparatus to try and realign the teeth. All was well for a good few years eight, nine, ten, eleven. But anyone older than that in the room knows very well, and I speak to most of us, from that time on, girls undergo their natural growth spurt. That's what happened to our young lady. She went through a growth spurt, and rather rapidly, the jaw started to become an issue. Rather than being just a normal person, suddenly, just in those crucial years when she was entering teenagerhood, she started to turn into a bit of a gargoyle. Heavy jaw, less gorgeous than everybody else around her, which is what all teenagers think. So. I don't feel too sorry for her at this point. 
However, she did have an older sister who became a cover girl, a magazine cover girl, a model, worked on TV, worked on the radio. She was also a superstar academic, and it left our teenager feeling pretty disgruntled and hard done by, by this experience, living a slightly awkward life with this big hefty jaw, an old glamour girl doing her stuff on the catwalk. Not good. You with me, girls? Yeah, we hate her already, don't we? No, we don't. We love her, really. <laughs> anyway, the story goes on. The teenager did make progress through school fairly successfully, but as she approached the end of her schooling, 16, difficulties were evident. She failed to say the letter S. Now, that's a serious problem. Not really. But it can be. Let's just try doing something together. You ready for this little activity? Sister Susie's sewing socks for soldiers. Spin it out for me. Excellent. Lots of siblings there. Now, you're going to try that all over again. But this time, <coughs> like me, pull a bulldog face. Push your lower jaw forward. Like this. Off you go. Say it again. <laughs> Absolutely dreadful. Just like I thought you'd be. That's what it's like if you can't say S. You may also, if your lower jaw was too far forward, fail to be able to bite through things. You imagine biting into an apple. If you had an apple here, just imagine what it would be like. Not so easy, huh? So there were mechanical difficulties for our young lady as well. She couldn't speak properly. She looked a bit of a freak. She was definitely different. Definitely different. But something great happened. Something great happened. A miracle maker came into her life. A fantastic, absolutely, enormously famous man who was a surgeon. He performed an amazing operation called a bilateral mandibular osteotomy. And that basically means you chop the jaw in two places and jam it back. It transformed her. Her life was completely different. She landed up being exactly the person she wanted to be. Her life was fulfilled. She was absolutely different. Transformational surgery. I'm a strong believer in it. Why? Because it does transform lives. If it's essential, it must happen. She did live happily ever after. Her surgeon said, you will be married in 10 years. Bring me the picture. She did have a blessed and fulfilling life. So you've sat patiently listening. Can I show you some pictures?